Hello everyone, this is Irina. Welcome back to my channel uh, on different topics related to language and culture, mainly uh, on uh, Norse, respectively Nordic or German culture. I'm a teacher of history and a historian, or at least I'm trying to be, and uh, I welcome you warmly to this uh, channel where I try to present um, some things from my area of interest. Um, if you like what I'm talking about, please uh, subscribe to my channel and help it grow because it is still very small and very at the beginning. Um, so this topic a little belated, but not uh, that late. I huh? was still uh, uh, on time, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, mid summer, so the summer solstice. Um, and of course, I'm going to start this uh, small presentation by wishing everyone celebrating um, the summer solstice, especially persons uh, from uh, Sweden and the Nordic countries and Germanic speaking countries. Glad mid summer. Yeah, so it's, um, uh, it's a pretty important celebration, especially in Sweden, where it is actually actually uh, more essential to the culture than, well, the national day itself. And speaking of which, I also have uh, an overview uh, of the national day celebration in Sweden. If you want to check it out, uh, click on the card above. All right, so let's uh, see what this tradition is about um, in Sweden, some origins and um, um, elements uh, that constitute uh, this important feast. So, um, in old traditional society, um, this was mainly um, linked to love and eroticism, and it was a magical night. A magical night belonging, uh, above all else, to uh, young people, to the youth, um, who would party, feast until uh, the dawn. But, of course, um, this tradition, as well as many other traditions, um, has changed over time. So we cannot say that, um, you know, um, these elements have been preserved as such from uh, since time immemorial and um, uh, nothing has shifted. Um, there are different elements belonging uh, both to the past and to the present being mixed in this um, uh, in this tradition. So, like I said before, it is uh, Sweden's um, uh, greatest and um, uh, most important, significant celebration because, you know, summer has arrived and uh, the nights are longer, they're brighter um, and people erect a maypole. My stong um, is decorated, um, is um, uh, filled with all kinds of bows and wreaths and uh, flowers, and uh, people dance around it, and they eat a lot of strawberries. So it's um, it's very heavy on tradition, um, and um, you know the justification is let's preserve more or less our customs but yeah like i said before these traditions can be also deceitful at the same time because they are in constant change and they are not always what they seem to be so in the sense that it's very difficult to um, figure out which element uh, appeared when and why they changed and why they're disappearing some of them and so on so it is a great mixture of both newer and older traditions and um, yeah its history uh, is a little bit shrouded in darkness um, but of course um, we have this um, um, very commonplace element of um, you know dancing around uh, this maple and um, um, we can link this to older traditions related to uh, fertility um, in this time of year, so the summer sol solstice, and um, um, many times you will find on the internet the information that this um, um, my stong would be uh, some kind of representation, symbolic representation of uh, of a phallus, yeah, so um, a fertility symbol. Um, 
we don't really know for sure if we can actually link it to uh, such a symbology. We don't really know for sure if um, it was indeed related to, um, you know, uh, Germanic peoples and their uh, cultural links to uh, trees and forests and um, uh, to these um, uh, wooden idols, uh, tall wooden idols, for example, of which we have um, some, yeah, some hints in older sources. Um, so it's not that clear if it is indeed <clears throat> uh, such a phallic symbol or rather something else. Um, but anyway, um, you know, uh, apart from this um, let's say unclear reference to um, uh, to fertility uh, there is a lot of ritual drinking involved and we do have hints of this ritual drinking in um, um, in uh, um, sources about the uh, viking times for example we have festivals uh, the so-called blot festivals of sacrifice where people indeed engaged in a lot of uh, drinking um, so this uh, my stong, um, it has, like I said, all kinds of decorations. Um, yeah, of course, it hasn't always been the same manner to decorate it. Uh, but generally speaking, it involves ribbons and wreaths and colored eggshells. Um, <clears throat> or, yeah, nowadays, I think, um, um, yeah, it's more more like leaves and flowers uh, but in the 16th century it was a little richer than this um, speaking of the 16th century this is uh, something that um, uh, the nordic peoples took from um, other germanic speaking countries yeah so yeah territories uh, belonging to the holy roman empire um, and um, because yeah um, this um, warmer season was um, um, let's say celebrated uh, in these areas a little earlier so in may um around somewhere um, some sometime around the month of may um they um, uh, shifted it a little later the nordic peoples and um, um it doesn't only have to do with uh, the month may it also has to do with uh, the verb at maya which is to uh, exactly this to decorate with something green yeah of course uh, the two of them are linked uh, together um all right so um um you yeah you can see here people um yeah uh, erecting this uh, this maypole we have uh, a lot of pictures from um, uh, from the beginning of the 20th century for example with um, yeah people doing it in all kinds of places from Jotteborg uh, for example um there are records of it um pretty nice ones <clears throat> Eighteenth, nineteenth century, um, we have uh, some material that talks to us um, about how people celebrated it. But like I said, this is from uh, the eighteenth, nineteenth century. So um, yeah, before that, uh, there is this the um, sense of unclarity with regard to what exactly they were doing but in the 19th century um yeah in traditional in this traditional society people used to um you know clean their houses and um uh, sweep their floors and uh, iron their of their um, ovens and stoves and uh, then uh, the gardens were also decorated and uh cleaned up um, uh, the textiles were aired, for example, so everything was uh, was prepared, yeah, uh, purified, if you will, uh, in order to receive uh, the midnight sun. Um, so after this cleaning up, they would decorate both uh, the inside and the outside of the house with uh, flowers and uh, trees um, from all kinds of trees, but in particular from the birch tree. Um, and also they would um, spread leaves on uh, the floor um, and everything was supposed to smell wonderfully. Yeah, both inside and outside the house and um, outside uh, on the door, uh, they would also um, attach these um, um, rich uh, wreaths, um, leaves and flowers and um, then take them far away uh, to the fields as well. 
Um, they also decorated the uh, places where they used to, to hold these parties, these feasts, and um, uh, also the, the ways uh, going into that direction, uh, boats as well, carriages and so on. Um, and um, uh, there were also markets, markets where peasants would sell uh, different kinds of bows and wreaths. Like a kind of uh, rich rite of passage. Um, in terms of food, well, um, food that is served at the summer solstice, at the midsummer, is supposed to be um, quite festive. Um, and the, the choice of, uh, of the food is, of course, related to where exactly you live and uh, what uh, means you have at your uh, disposal. Um, so if um, if you look again at the records um, we have in museums such as Nordiska Museet, yet we are often often going to find uh, mentions of, um, of fish, but also of meat, uh, pork, although not that often. And of course we have um, uh, the porridge, um, even filet mignon, and um, um, yeah, uh, maybe it sounds a little strange that uh, porridge would be considered um, like. Uh, celebration food, um, but uh, it was a special kind of porridge. Yeah, so it was um, um, it was made with uh, with milk instead of water, and uh, with the wheat flour or barley flour, uh, and um, yeah, a little later also with um, rice groats. So um, nowadays, maybe the most popular is uh, again fish, and particularly herring in all its forms, a seal. Um, and um, also fresh potatoes and very important strawberries, a lot of strawberries, but they have to be Swedish. This is very important. They have to be picked in uh, uh, in the forests of Sweden and, um, you know, the uh, uh, the Jordgubbar, uh, they are very, very small, but they are also very tasty and very um, sweet. So they're pretty appreciated. Um, yes, of course, and there is a lot of drinking uh, going on from um, uh, from beer to um, uh, the um, um, spirits, yeah, snaps. Um, they belong to the menu from yeah from the 19th century, and I suppose uh, much uh, much earlier than that, uh, at least in the case of beer. And of course, we have a lot of drinking songs associated with them. Yeah, also part of this ritual, uh, perhaps the most famous of them all, is Hielan Gor, uh, which would mean something like um, um, the whole of it goes with reference to the alcohol. You can uh, something like sip it down or you won't get the other half, uh, something like that. Um, yes, and uh, again, something very famous linked to this uh, this tradition is uh, a song and a dance called Små Grudorna. Uh, Små Grudorna, uh, this is the small frogs um, and uh, uh, yeah, people dance uh, in a circle and uh, it's, uh, it's very fun, uh, also used to be very fun. Um, and um, uh, it became some kind of national symbol even for this uh, Midsummer Fest. Um, and um, um, you don't really find it um, in um, older records. I mean, before the 18th, 19th century, you don't really have any traces of it. Um, and uh, yeah, um, most people say or most researchers say that this um, uh, is actually something new from the beginning of the 20th century when we do actually have uh, a song book uh, from a, yeah, let's say cultural uh, educational facility uh, in Nes. This is um, in, um, in the vicinity of Jötebori, uh, so um, um, in the west uh, of the country. And um, this educational facility was supposed to have as a main task the preservation of uh, yeah, traditional cu culture, of uh, farmer culture, and um, there was a lot of handiwork involved and also, um, yeah, songwriting, popular uh, folk songs. 
Um, and yeah, like I said, we have this uh, record from 1922, uh, this, uh, uh, this song book where we find the song about the small uh, frogs. It was, yeah, maybe some kind of prank, prank song. It wouldn't be the first one. Um, but um, uh, I've also seen on the internet this um, uh, this concept that it was somehow related to uh, to a song from the time of Napoleon and you know French being associated uh, with the frogs in uh, both the ridiculous and offensive manner. Uh, so afterwards, the British did that, and maybe yeah, the uh, Swedes borrowed this um, uh, this folk song. Uh, stereotypical folk song and turned it into their own tradition, but I find it really far-fetched, so uh, I think it rather has to do with, um, um, you know, local uh, songs be being recorded at, at the beginning of the 20th century and then um, uh, being made appear older than uh, they really were. Um, and uh, yes, uh, besides this, uh, we also have uh, more pranks uh, related to this uh, this holiday. So um, this again was something they did like a hundred years ago, but I think uh, they have preserved it in some parts of Sweden at least. Um, it's um, um, the thing with um, um, dressing up uh, a bride and a groom, and then you get to choose a midsummer bride, a midsummer brud, um, and uh, then a groom uh, for her. So the bride would be, yeah, dressed uh, um, very nicely, very properly, um, and she would be taken um, around the villages and shown, um, and then people would ask uh, for, um, you know, special gifts um, uh, to um, uh, to have for the party afterwards. Um, yeah, either this or they could also have uh, pairs made of people wearing crowns, yeah, kransar, um, and um, they would, uh, so these wannabe couples would dance together all night um, and uh, girls would also uh, bind um, these wreaths for uh, the boys they liked um, as a sign that they uh, belonged together. Yeah, because one uh, one of the main elements of this uh, celebration was the fact that it was um, uh, related to this aspect of uh, love and eroticism. Um, all right, and young, young people, of course. Uh, and speaking of uh, young people, um, they also had, and I think, again, in some parts, that they still have the uh, Lövgubben. Uh, this would be... Um, a boy dressed up completely in leaves. So he had a costume made out of leaves. So that's also pretty compelling. Um, yes, of course, um, people tended sometimes to have problems with the church because of it. Um, yeah, because it was not seen as very, uh, as very decent, as very proper, moral and so on. Um, yeah, so um, maybe this also triggered some changes in uh, uh, traditions in um, uh, the course of time but definitely did not um, did not eliminate the tradition um, like uh, for good uh, in terms of uh, dancing areas well um, if they did not have um, a maple um, they could choose another place to do it yeah so they could choose um some it had to be flat either way some meadow near a river uh or a significant magically in this um uh, in this period as well um okay so something which is not that common in sweden but it is common in um, um in denmark and norway uh when they celebrate on the 23rd of June, uh, saying tense often uh, is to lighten up a midsummer bowl. Yeah, so um, lighting up these fires and um, uh, dancing around the fires. Um, this um, may be linked to some earlier customs uh, because we have, for example, the writer uh, Olaus Magnus um, in the late Middle Ages um, writing about this, mentioning this, and the tradition may even be, uh, may even be, um, um, you know, 
traced back even earlier. Um, okay, so in Sweden, I think uh, we can find some stories about dancing around the fires in the 18th, maybe 19th century as well. Um, and um, uh, nowadays, I think it is common or more common to do it um, at Easter or rather Valbori. Um, yeah, but of course, like I said, it depends a lot on uh, on the region as well. A magical night, so a night of trolldom. Um, yeah, trolldom is a word meaning uh, magic or sorcery. Uh, again, something very uh, specific to traditional societies. Um, yeah, people used to think that nature was infused with these um, with these powerful forces, and the border uh, between the world of men and the world of uh, the supernatural um, was a little thinner in this um, night and. You can go, um, you could cross it and um, uh, go from um, uh, from one world to uh, to the other. So many magical things could happen this night. Uh, people um, used to uh, and still used to pick up uh, medicinal plants, for example. Medicinal plants are considered to be extremely powerful, um, especially in um, in this night in midsummer. And um, not only plants uh, could be effective, um, but also midsummer uh, do. Yeah, so this is also sought after. So um, uh, people, for example, used to um, you know, go barefoot uh, in this dew because they thought it made you uh, particularly strong and fresh uh, all uh, year long. Um, either this or they used to gather this dew in order to heal um, sickness um, or to help with the fermentation of bread and, um, uh, and beer. Yes, and uh, they also uh, they were also searching for magical springs, for example, again, in with the same superstition that um, uh, become healthier and mightier. Uh, and this was also an appropriate time for treasure hunters. Yeah, because it was um, it was said that uh, magical treasures uh, in this time in the special night would rise from the earth and would become visible for people so people could see them and if if they kept silent uh, they could even get them yeah so uh, silence was very important in this tradition because if um, uh, if you broke the silence you risked the treasure also disappearing um, so yeah we have a lot of a um, uh, lot of traditions involving divination as well spodom yeah divination um, also warnings, prophecies, again, very specific to all traditional societies, not only this one, the Nordic one. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it was considered an appropriate time to try to uh, figure out the future, to foresee the future. Um, and because it was also the um, uh, celebration of love, people wanted to know um, whom they were going to spend the rest of their days with. Um, so something people used to do again I am not sure if or how often people still do it yeah I think it depends mostly um, then again it's a more secular uh, celebration now than it used to be um, either way so um, uh, back in the day people used to um, um, yeah engage in these uh, playful divinations for example they used to gather uh, flowers and put them under the pillow in order to dream of um, of the man they would marry of their partner um, so uh, uh, girls would usually pick uh, an odd number of flowers yeah so um, seven or nine yeah I think it was around this um, uh, this number um, and again they should have picked these flowers under a vow of silence yeah silence was uh, considered something like a magical contract yeah so in order to reach the other side if you want 
um, in order to um, uh, gain access to a superior um, uh, knowledge. Yeah, so they used to pick these flowers in silence and put them under the pillow. Um, and uh, the odd number has uh, to do with the fact that, again, in traditional societies, even numbers were considered to be um, all right, a sign of harmony, so something normal. But then again, for this special occasion, you needed something which was not normal. On the contrary, yeah. Um, all right, so we have this very important theme of uh, crossing, yeah, crossing uh, boundaries. Um, stories yeah for example um, I found this one um, um, one record that uh, stated that uh, uh, yeah there was one one tradition in the 19th century that said um, um, you know you had to um, uh, again make your own porridge and it had to be very salty uh, and then you were supposed to go to bed without drinking anything and you would dream the girl would dream of her future partner coming to her and offering her something to quench her thirst yeah um and um in um, uh, in in a legend that is found in the parish in Jemtland, um, uh, for example um there is the story about these three girls um meeting at the crossroads yeah crossroads again very important element in this tradition as well um, and uh, the first one heard uh, the slamming of a smith and the second one heard the sound of a violin and the third one heard some church bells and the story goes that the first girl married the smith and the second one married uh, the musician and unfortunately the third girl died because she uh, foresaw her own funeral so it's uh, 19th century records are filled with such uh, such stories, such traditions, and I am sure you can find something similar in a lot of other cultures. Um, so in, in my own culture, um, I may have told you this before, I am um, originally Romanian. Uh, we also have a similar tradition um, at the summer solstice, something about uh, fairies, um, again, um, this topic of crossroads and crossing realms and so on, uh, it's, uh, it's really something very specific to um, archaic uh, societies. And uh, I think we, as modern, as modern societies, we kept them in one form of another or another, but again, in a very secular one. Yeah, so uh, I think we kept the part with the drinking and with the dancing uh, around the maple or not. <laughs> but um, yeah, regarding the other elements, um, I don't think they play an important part for us um, um, any longer. But then again, it's uh, interesting to um, uh, to know about them. All right, um, that's it for today. Uh, I hope you found out at least uh, a little bit of um, um, of unknown information. And uh, if you want to uh, follow me. We're for more topics, for more similar topics, just hit the subscribe button. Thank you very much and once again, happy summer solstice. Glad mid sommar.